Hello and welcome to the second edition of Insights and Power, where internet scientists meet decision makers and policymakers. Today, we will inquire for the second time what research expects from platforms and what platforms expect from research. This event series is organized by the Leibniz Institute for Media Research, the Hans Bredo Institute, and the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. We are going to talk about the challenges of finding consensus in a diverse Europe regarding the rules for online communication spaces, how to regulate, in other words, the digital field in light of new actors, new tools to implement those norms, new hybrid settings, new ways to exercise power. And we have with us today a key voice in the development of uh, European digital law with a deep experience in data protection, in hate speech, in fighting disinformation, in ensuring media freedom. We have with us today Renate Nikolai. She is head of cabinet of uh, Commissioner Jurshova, who the vice president for values and transparency. Renate Nikolai has worked on matters such as rule of law and disinformation and media freedom for a long time with the commission. She was uh, previous to her current position, director in charge of Asia and Latin America in the uh, trade uh, director general. And for five years, head of cabinet of the Commissioner for Justice, Consumer and Gender Equality. She also played a key role in the development of uh, the establishment of the European Public Prosecutor and the Code of Conduct regarding online hate speech. Talking with her will be uh, Professor Wolfgang Schulz, the director of both the Leibniz Institute for Media Research and the uh, Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. He is a, a university professor for media law at the University of Hamburg. My name is Matthias Kettemann, and I will be moderating this talk today. You have the opportunity to uh, take part and ask your questions, and we'll be happy to include them at a later stage. But now let's start with the topic at hand. What about the role of Europe in the concert of regulating online communication spaces? Or is there no such thing as a concert? Is it actually only European regulators who are playing the, the violin of uh, new norms for the internet and for online platforms? And if that's so, is that a problem? Is it a problem that we're only looking at Europe and expect only Europe to do something? Or is that something that European policymakers have become rather comfortable with? Ms. Nikolai, are you happy about the role that Europe plays in online regulation? Yes, I am, uh, because honestly, I think we're quite well prepared to play, maybe to pick up your picture, the first violin <laughs> in a concert. Um, so this is not against anybody. This is not without, uh, you know, being open to uh, coordinate, to kind of, you know, engage in international partnerships. But um, it's really based on our first mover advantage experience, I would say. And that very much comes from the fact that we were, because we had an old data protection directive, 20 years old, <laughs> Um, for very good reasons, you know, actually 10 years ago, <laughs> we presented a draft for um, a revised, modern, horizontal data protection law, one law for one continent. And there were many reasons why. And it was a different time of, you know, regulating the Internet. But nevertheless, uh, it gave us an advantage over many other international partners because we engaged in this debate and we finalized a modern uh, data protection law. Uh, which is the kind of the basis of what you do next on regulating the information space. Um, and based on the ex experience, we could then, then deal with, you know, in the, in the last mandate, so before presenting the regulatory initiatives of, of this mandate, we could experience, um, you know, dealing with the new rules, but also kind of building uh, um, interesting new ideas in um, addressing challenges whether that was disinformation or hate speech, experimenting with researchers, with platforms, and 
learning, really. It was a learning exercise. It wasn't yet the time to go into full regulation, but it was an important um, experience um, gathering phase. Uh, and building on that, we could indeed, at the end of 2020, come with our digital rulebook. Um, first ones in the international kind of, you know, concert um, that we are happily discussing with international partners and that we are advancing on very well. Sometimes it feels a bit lonely, <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, uh, as I said, I think we are well equipped. Um, and if you take, you know, the transatlantic example, where they are not at the same level of regulating and will probably not come in the very near future at the same level, also because of different traditions. But nevertheless, um, you know, there's the Trade and Technology Council that you might be aware of. And this is a very important forum to also exchange views and debate, um, you know, responses to uh, uh, regulatory challenges that we face, and it can be done in, in, in very good, uh, you know, cooperation spirit as well. So we we um, know from research that even the predecessor of the GDPR was extremely influential globally. Um, so there is some empirical evidence on that. We do not have so much research on the impact of regulation in other uh, parts of the world, which is a pity. I think we need more. Um, but that was already um, extremely influential and at least in two ways. One is as a kind of de facto standard that develops because the European market is so big, so important globally. Um, and the second thing is that it was a kind of role model for other countries, so just uh, partially or even um, um, copying it or taking over the whole concept of, of data protection. And what I hear from, from our colleagues globally is... Um, maybe twofold. One is that they really appreciate that Europe um, goes forward. But on the other hand, of course, it's a little bit uh, a worry that um, uh, the Global South, for example, other, other voices, um, other perspectives, other values, maybe um, not be able to unfold as, as they wish. And so my question would be, um, uh, to what extent is when you prepare regulation on the European level, this potential impact something that is already considered. I know it's it's difficult um, because it's um, complex enough uh, to get regulation through in Europe with all the different stakeholders. Um, but does that play a role? And is there, one thing is the global south, the other thing is, is there a kind of informal conversation between the EU and the US, for example, seeing that most of the platforms are uh, US-based um, to see where do we want to go with liability and, and, and so on. If you could um, disclose that a little bit, uh, that would be extremely interesting. Yeah, I think, I think if you look at, you know, this is not just any regulation. I mean, when you kind of work on, uh, on issues, whether it's the GDPR or whether it's the Digital Services Act, these are really, you know, fundamental kind of regulatory masterpieces, ideally, <laughs> that have an impact for, you know, decades to come. Uh, and because we are, you know, by far the biggest single market, um, a very attractive place to do business. Sure. Um, and that's our, you know, super economic superpower. We are, you know, building on becoming a geopolitical power as well. But we have always been, a, a, you know, an economic a superpower because of the single market. Um, and, you know, it's very clear that when you're working on that, and since, since we are always following the better regulation, uh, you know, uh, roadmap, uh, it means we have public consultations, we have targeted consultations with key stakeholders, and you can imagine, I mean, something like the Digital Markets Act, which is a kind of quite daring thing to do in an ex ante pre-competition rules uh, approach to say, hey, you have big platforms, a gatekeeper a role, and as a gatekeeper, you will have certain things that you simply cannot do. Um, and you need to disclose other things more. So um, this was, of course, a huge challenge for some of our US-based uh, companies, partners, and of course had also an impact on our conversations with the US administration and US government colleagues. Um, the same goes for, you know, I would say key Asian partners, um, because with whom we already have quite close um, uh, um, economic and trade ties. I'm talking now South Korea or Japan, where we have free trade agreements. 
and where of course you know um, uh, knowing that the future of you know economic interaction is also very much in the services area and that's why where the kind of the data economy um, and the information space comes in, they take a very keen example and they have indeed been inspired in many regards from the principles that we are discussing. So that's actually a very fruitful cooperation uh, on both sides, I would say. Uh, then of course you have partners such as China um, where you, you have a different concept <laughs> of you know, the information space. I wouldn't say that's so much of a meeting of minds, but since you spoke about the global South, I wouldn't say that I wouldn't go as far as saying that this has really influenced our thinking. I mean, a lot of I can only, you know, share with you that every big thing, I mean, anything we are we are deciding what goes through the College of Commissioners. So that's really always a collective decision making process. So that means that also our, you know, colleagues who are more focusing on the uh, external relations work of the union. So the development commissioner, the high representative representative vice president, um, you know, the, 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 the commissioner dealing with uh, the neighborhood, um, they are all part of that. And very, very often, I can reassure you, in the discussions on certain initiatives, they would say, hey, wait a minute, what impact will that have on our development cooperation? And uh, I, I don't think that it was so much that we thought about, you know, will these concepts work for the global south, but more that, you know, part of the, 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 um, I would say the digital decade uh, approach mm -hmm. that we are very much pursuing, knowing that this is one of the key transformational changes that we are living through at the moment in this decade, um, has also influenced our thinking about, for instance, our relationship with Africa. And there was recently an EU Africa summit, which wasn't so much about, you know, comparing notes on the regulation, but which was definitely about, you know, um, recreating uh, a narrative between, um, you know, partners that is more an investment, uh, you know, partnership, uh, where, for instance, the digital transition and the digital transformation is key. And there are very great stories of wonderful startups in kind of, you know, places such as Ghana or, you know, where. So, so I, I think there is actually um, quite some triggering effect on, you know, our key agenda on digital transformation that also has an impact on how we support um, uh, partners in kind of, you know, gaining up uh, with us. But the regulation was very much driven by, as I said earlier, by the experience that we gained based on the GDPR and then also with the self-regulatory, uh, you know, tests um, that we have done in the past years. Yeah, it's inter interesting, if, if Matthias, if I may, it's interesting that you um, mentioned Africa, uh, just as a side note, because we had an, a project on, on ethics of digitization, which was a global project with partners from all over the world. Um, and we actually had a, a research sprint, as we called it, um, with young colleagues from Africa. And one of the issues they tossed around was uh, we are talking about uh, African digital sovereignty. And when you in Europe talk about sovereignty, what does that mean? Does that mean that you want to fence you in and, and build, build walls to Africa? Of course, that cannot be the thing that is in accordance with the European values. Um, mm. But we could see how um, interested they were in how Europe uh, frames a narrative like uh, digital sovereignty for these yeah. colleagues in Africa. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a kind of a key topic as well, digital sovereignty, because you can indeed read it in different ways. You can kind of say, oh, this is now a point of departure for the union uh, who has always been a free trader, um, you know, par excellence, uh, just because we are a multilateral, uh, you know, organization ourselves and, you know, we, we breathe and, 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 you know, this every day. Um, or, or is this something else? And I think it is something else. It's not a point of departure from, you know, that we are adamantly against kind of closing shop kind of, you know, philosophies such as, you know, data localization requirements. You know, we are fighting that in every trade agreement that we are negotiating. But the matter of the fact is also that, you know, part, so we are engaged a lot in rulemaking and, and happily so. And I think, as I said, well-equipped but it's part of a bigger kind of narrative on kind of, you know, using the potential of the data economy in a better way. Uh, we've learned the example of the first wave, I would say, of the use of data, 
which was the you know personal data. We saw the Silicon Valley economy kind of models developing. We are now again with the transitions that we are trying to kind of support and to shape and to design. And this is on the one hand a digital transition with all the kind of you know potentials, but it's also the the green transition because they are linked. Because if you think of smart uh, agriculture or smart mobility. Um, or smart energy solutions, they will all have to be fed by data. Um, and so th this is a totally different approach to the data economy um, compared to where we were a decade ago when um, you know, we worked on the, on the GDPR proposal because um, you know, we, we, we have now the data privacy rules in place. We will not depart from that. But that doesn't mean that you cannot untap the potential of the best use of data. But you know, when you look at things such as the Data Governance Act or the Data Act, then they are all driven by the fact, exploit the data, but exploit it in a way that the individual stays in control and find different models you know, of you know, sharing of data, giving access to data, portability of data, but not so much anymore only driven by what was maybe at the time of the GDPR, the key driver, because we had Snowden, we had the mass surveillance issues, uh, data minimization. It's still also a concept, but I think now in this kind of digital transition, we've moved a little bit into, let's make a use, uh, a fair, a human-centric use of the data economy. Mm -hmm. And that's a little bit digital sovereignty, huh? because that we want to do in Europe by exploiting the talents we have, the innovation potential we have, so that smart solutions in kind of, you know, linking up also the different economic players uh, uh, where they need to kind of use the data. If you really want to have a data space on health or on mobility, which is something we're working on, then we need to connect, um, you know, these different, you know, economic players. Mm. That's what I understand in the, under digital sovereignty, not about closing the shop. International partners are very welcome there as well. And that's yeah. actually what the, the, the narrative that the African colleagues had as well. So um, um, that was really great. And I think there's a lot of potential to, to interact there. And I guess also more about being a, a rule maker than a rule taker, as you've uh, put it somewhere. Um, I think the, I like this this idea of, of data as a sort of a prism through which to look at the different phases of um, of internet regulation, from data as something to be you know minimized and and uh, avoided to something that has to be used and whose use has to be policed in a way and individuals and also small and medium enterprises have to be protected from um, from misuses of data by by larger gatekeepers. Um, Perhaps if we if we move to to an, an, a question that is also uh, of, of of high interest to the way that um, that research and and, and policy making interacts, um, we, we've seen in the past uh, companies, uh, including Facebook, calling for more rules, for more regulation, and spending quite substantial amounts both in Washington and in Brussels to um, to influence how how rules how rules are set. Um, at the same time. Um, scientists uh, also try to influence how rules are set. It's kind of our job, right, to provide input. Um, if you look at sort of your, your experience, uh, both at the GDPR and uh, now coming at, out of the, the, um, the intensive phase regarding DSA and, DS, uh, DSA and DMA, do you see any, you know, any larger picture developments in the interaction of uh, policymakers, lobbyists, uh, scientists, are we moving to a good direction? Are we doing things wrong? Are we being too imprecise? Do we want too much? Um, I strongly believe in, in strong partnerships of these players. And I think there is still room to kind of, you know, bring that all more together. Um, indeed, what I observe over the last decade that I was involved in kind of, let's say, digital rulemaking in the broader sense, that we moved away from kind of leave your hands off <laughs> to, um, oh, it's much better if we know what the rules are, <laughs> because then we can simply comply with it. Um, that, that's a good thing. But then we are also um, facing the dilemma that, you know, this is a super dynamic process. And uh, to kind of create the right kind of setup of rules that should last for such a dynamic process, 
uh, where at the same time, you also want AI to flourish. And, you know, so, so I mean, it's really dynamic. Um, so we don't know all the technological solutions, all the issues, you know, uh, so we really have to keep on our toes and we have to be honest to each other that whilst I continue to defend that it's in this area, if you're well prepared as we are, an advantage again to be the first mover, we need to kind of set up the right structures that allow us to always adapt and to kind of, you know, have systems in play that can bring in the latest kind of thing. Let's give two examples. Um, if you take the DSA, uh, the flops, the very large online platforms in the future will be under a totally different regime from what they have known so far with GDPR, where of course they apply it like the SME supply it. You know. There, they will be subject to a regular auditing. They will be subject to risk mitigation aspects. They will have to kind of, you know, bring evidence. They will have to work with kind of, you know, bodies to explain what they are doing. So I think there is a huge possibility to actually for the different actors to come closer together and to have a permanent conversation on how the challenges are being addressed. Uh, and not only the big consultancy firms, I hope also the researchers, <laughs> because you have an important role in this. Uh, or another example, um, you know, disinformation, that's uh, an area where it's not so easy to regulate. I mean, and if you see the kind of the rules that we have with the GDPR, with the DSA, they are not going to resolve the issue of disinformation, uh, because disinformation is not illegal per se. Um, you cannot simply regulate it away. That's why also in Europe, we don't, we have the European Democracy Action Plan as another kind of, you know, concept. Um, and it has a totally different approach. Yes, we are working on a new pact on disinformation with the platforms because the platforms as the channels of disinformation have an important role and the responsibility to, to, to take. But, you know, this is again, you know, we will have, an, we need an all society approach and we need kind of the systems to actually interact better. We had this code of practice, which showed that there was simply not enough cooperation with researchers. There was not enough possibility for you researchers to get access to the data of the Facebooks and others so that you could really work with it and analyze and kind of, you know, be a partner in addressing the kind of the challenges of, I don't know, uh, um, uh, the, the effect of, of, of targeting of algorithm lack of transparency together, you know, and I think this has to change. Uh, so it, it's rules on the one hand, but it's also accompanied in fields where it's less easy to give final statements on the rules with dynamic processes where we will need to keep everybody, the rule makers, but the researchers, the economic operators on their toes to address the issues as they develop. Um, I'm very much convinced of that. So I think that's a challenge for all of us because we're not necessarily used to that. Um, sometimes we try to make a law and, then, you know, I, I am a lawyer, but I know about the, the dynamic process of interpretation of law, but this is really a very, very dynamic kind of, you know, context here. And that's where I see huge potential. I think, you know, the two things that I just gave as examples are built in to our uh, rule setting to allow for follow up work in a kind of dynamic process. And I'm very happy about that. The, the, um talking about the dynamic and this uh, two acts um, uh, we are talking about. Uh, one thing um, or one worry we as an academic community have from time to time is um, that uh, this field is politically so sensitive and uh, to be frank, the, the uh, lobby clash going on there with the media industry on the one hand and the um, IT companies on the other hand, um, sometimes has a degree of, of um, uh, creates an atmosphere that you have the impression that with uh, studies, rational arguments and so on, it's really hard to get through. But maybe that's, um, that's wrong. And uh, there are a lot of people listening uh, within the commission or the parliament uh, um, or the member states um, uh, to this kind of input that academia can give because that is a specific kind of input that it is normally requires more time to digest. It's not just um, the idea, do it this way or put this kind of thing in, in article two um, and uh, then everything is, is uh, in order. 
um, but normally it's more nuanced. It's um, um, of course that's uh, the the uh, what we can deliver, but it's also problematic to to digest that in a highly um, um, contested um, atmosphere in, in there. Um, is our impression correct there, or is it um, that it is hard to get through with an academic nuance position? Or well, I, I wouldn't say that that it's, it's that it's always hard, but I, I think you know, as I said, I think we're not so used to kind of you know do this um, you know on a regular basis together. I mean, we all rely on empiric studies. We all rely on kind of you know that's part again of our better regulation approach. I think what um, what, what is new is maybe in this concept to actually in the execution of the rules to be a partner and to have a much broader approach on the execution of the rules because you know of course you need to have you know a competent authority uh, the member states or the, or the commission to kind of do that on a day to day basis but because this is such a dynamic process it's not static. And that's why, you know, we need, um, I think, joint thinking to always mm -hmm. be ready. I give you again from my data protection context and, and you know, um, uh, the experience. And that's a different setup to compare to what we are creating with the Digital Services Act. Now, there we came from an area where we had already 27 data protection authorities in all the member states one at least you know in, in Germany we have many more and uh, so so they they already had their role in executing kind of the rules but of course what was new with the data protection rules was all of a sudden we had common rules we didn't have a directive that was translated into different national laws we had a common rule because it's a regulation now so we needed also to ensure a harmonized approach. We needed to bring them more closely together. We created that board and they kind of, you know, work on that together. Very interesting experience for them to become a club of executors of law. But what they have really done is they developed guidelines. They developed mm -hmm. kind of on all sorts of themes uh, because it just so happened, you know, and one of them immediately was on artificial intelligence, because, of course, what we had designed, for instance, in 2012, it's our draft law on GDPR is miles away from where we are in the AI discussion now. And that's what I mean, you know, and I think this will be exactly the same on the DSA, because, you know, um, algorithm transparency, dark pattern, you know, yes, we are addressing the kind of the key themes now. But who knows what challenges we will have on these, um, you know, in a couple of years time. And that's where I think in the execution phase, we need this kind of, you know, sort of a rapid response <laughs> structure, uh, which, uh, which we have to, to rethink. Um, and, and that's where I think that's a challenge for all of us. Uh, but, you know, I wouldn't say that the researchers are one kind of side and we are totally apart. I think there's always been meeting points, but maybe more in the preparatory phase more. Mm -hmm. Whereas I see in this kind of challenge of regulating such a dynamic area, I, I see not much more kind of, you know, need um, for a permanent kind of, you know, collaboration structure. And that's, again, not totally new. I've never worked in that field. But if I look at the kind of dynamic aspects of environment or climate, they have that all the time because science is continuing and developing. And that's mm -hmm. where also you have to address the things. And, you know, so it's not unheard of. It's just that in our classical, you know, uh, justice lawmaking or regulatory kind of, you know, telecom rules or these old style mm -hmm. kind of things, we didn't have the dynamic process. But in the digital, we need to develop it. Mm. But isn't isn't, isn't that sorry? Isn't that just the uh, the thing that there's a big gap between um, you know those long running processes that lead into DMA or DSA and uh, very um, quick turnaround times when it comes to certain measures like uh, the newly the newly uh, adopted uh, measures um, against certain uh, Russian uh, state uh, state sponsored media outlets. Um, then we have to make a distinction between these kinds of, um, of, of, of measures and don't we need different kinds of different models for uh, EU uh, science interaction for those? Well, that's now very different things put together. I know. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know but uh, I mean, 
first of all, I, I, would, I would counter argue that, you know, the DSA making has been a super fast process. You know, I mean, you know, this mandate started in 2019. Uh, the DSA was presented at the end of 2020, and it will be finished by the French presidency. I mean, this is super rapid lawmaking if you compare it with the, with the, with the GDPR at the time. So it shows that we really kind of, you know, address a core issue here. Um, I think what you're coming at is that, you know, in everything we do, we have to think through rapid responses for extreme situations. Um, and since we are unfortunately in a war situation in Europe, we are up in front of us all of a sudden uh, a very uh, bad example uh, of the need that we need to kind of think the unthinkable and, and really be ready for all sorts of scenarios. And that's where, for instance, uh, you know, there is now a, a renewed discussion about the crisis protocol and the, under the Digital Services Act to see was that really fit for purpose because it was done in a pre-Ukrainian war scenario. And what you are mentioning on, you know, what was a sanctions discussion um, to kind of ban uh, the broadcasting uh, from Russia today and Sputnik, um, uh, that was of course linked to the sanctions work that we are doing, um, you know, in this, in this war scenario um, uh, to address uh, the Russian aggression. Uh, because these kind of, you know, media outlets have very specific links to the, to the Gremlin, have been created by a presidential degree. Uh, so they are, this isn't a, a digital <laughs> kind of, you know, rule uh, execution. It was really a sanctions decision. But uh, I do not want to hide here that, of course, this, again, this experience from this war uh, that is ongoing in Europe, um, has, of course, an impact also on what we are thinking now in terms of, you know, future, that's the next big rulemaking thing. It's also in the information space, the Media Freedom Act, where, of course, you know, the role of third country media players and how we go about that all of a sudden is much more, uh, uh, you know, on our radar compared to, you know, when we started that work uh, maybe one and a half years ago. So, indeed, that's the kind of, you know, evolution we are in crisis at the moment in the EU, you know, um, because we have to deal, um, you know, with a lot of, you know, uh, first ones. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and that requires also innovative new thinking. And uh, so I would agree with that, that something like it's, it's under the catchword of resilience, maybe, you know, to stay resilient against odds that we would probably not have thought about, you know, whether that's a virus that can create a global, you know, pandemic, or whether that's, uh, you know, an, an aggression um, uh, attacking the territorial sovereignty of, of, of countries on the European continent. Uh, those were things that we did not so much have on our radar um, at the beginning of this mandate. Mm. Uh, but, uh, since we, we have that uh, issue already, um, I was a little bit worried about this decision under the sanction package. Um, it's horrible what we see there, and it's horrible what you can see in, in this uh, programs of Russia Today and others, and it's without any doubt war propaganda, but nevertheless, um, we talked at the beginning of our uh, discussion here about the potential impact of regulation and uh, what we see is that uh, these decisions are watched by other uh, countries and uh, that can have, of course, unintended effects. Um, and so you mentioned the Media Freedom Act that might be a place where some protocols for situations like that could be um, um, established. We mentioned that in our uh, a submission we made to the Media Freedom Act as an institute, and, and that again is something that uh, is a traditional form of cooperation between um, yeah. academia and uh, and um, the Commission and other uh, engaged in lawmaking. But that brings me to, to another point, but of course you can reflect on, on, on that um, as well. And that is that uh, we more and more come to the conclusion that this traditional interaction between um, um, policymaking and, and academia, and that is you have a hearing, you have a report, and that's it. 
And it's not a kind of dialogue. It's more just uh, at a specific point in time, you hand over re results of a research and then it's done. Um, whether uh, we can come up with some more intelligent formats that are more uh, a kind of organized dialogue. And what uh, we have experimented with in the last couple of months is uh, that we set up um, research sprints uh, with researchers from different disciplines uh, with a specific issue at hand um, and uh, from different cultural backgrounds, from different countries. So we have some diversity built in there as well not only disciplines, but um, uh, cultural backgrounds. Um, and what we believe is that um, for specific policy instruments at a specific point in time of the development of something like the Media Freedom Act, it might be helpful to have a kind of parallel interdisciplinary reflection uh, process, um, um, which then can be more a kind of a dialogue. People could ask uh, this group of researchers, would get some responses and forth and back. And of course, policymakers are free to decide what they use and what is helpful and what is not helpful from the academic community. It's finally for them to decide, not for us. Is that something that um, uh, could be helpful to think more in this direction? I think we have that already, not on the Media Freedom Act, because that we want to deliver this summer. So it's too late for that. <laughs> um, but uh, indeed, when you look, for instance, at the, at the AI kind of the development of the AI kind of act, there you had a high level group already, you know, in the last mandate working on kind of, you know, things. And that high level group indeed included, uh, you know, business, um, uh, academia, um, so, so relevant stakeholders, um, uh, and I think that's that's a very normal pattern. You know, if you have a, a less urgent kind of, let's say, issue um, at hand, where you really want to kind of think it through and uh, you know work, you know, first on on um, uh, maybe some 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 guidance from stakeholders before you uh, translate that into regulation. I actually have seen that a lot um, in also in our in our digital kind of you know context. We haven't started shooting out of our hip immediately with kind of hard regulation. Um, there has really been a lot of preparatory work. Um, and uh, so I think that's when it's complex matters, uh, quite, a, quite a normal thing to do. Um, on the Media Freedom Act, it is linked to all these things. Uh, it's also not the first time that we are monitoring the situation on media pluralism and media uh, freedom. Um, you know, we had for the last decade uh, with the Florence Institute under the Media Pluralism Monitor, the MPM, uh, a very regular kind of, you know, uh, research <laughs> um, uh, input, um, you know, in, in, into the media situation uh, in the EU. We have, um, as you might know, now an annual rule of law report that looks at the situation on, in a very broad sense of rule of law in all the EU 27 member states, not only the independent judiciary, the fight against corruption, but also media pluralism and media freedom and other checks and balances. And that has now, we are just working on the, th on the third edition, which will come out at the, in July. And, and, and you know, it has also uh, every year gives an update on where we see member states in this. So that's why, you know, very often, you know, this isn't probably broad enough for what you have in mind now, but definitely, you know, this Florence Institute is an interdisciplinary international context that has gained experience in monitoring based on indicators, really kind of in a, in a very thorough scientific uh, approach um, uh, to monitor the situation. And that's, you know, that gives us, the basis for actually uh, working on the Media Freedom Act. Without that, that decade of work um, of dedicated researchers, we would not be in the place where we are right now. Yeah, it's great what they do. So we know the colleagues, of course, so that's, that's fantastic. And so um, if you have some ideas you want to, to share with us, so I would say it would be great if academia could deliver this or that. It's wonderful that we have the studies or that, but. Uh, um, this kind of format, this kind of timing, then that would be extremely helpful. Um, cannot, uh, of course, say that we would actually be able to do that because we have our own logic as well, but um, just to, to, to know that. Um, so is it more the conceptual level, for example? Is that something that would be helpful? Is it more empirical data? Um, if you have some ideas there, some, some questions, suggestions would be extremely appreciated. Yeah, or, I mean, more analysis. 
Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm of course now very deeply in the trenches of kind of getting our stuff out. Um, sure. But uh, in, in, in all regard, whether it's the new Media Freedom Act, whether it's the finalization of the things that we have already rolled out. But I think what we are looking at is really kind of, you know, recreating the kind of the ecosystems of the information space, right? And, and, and in that, uh, maybe that's just a thought. Um, I always have the feeling that we are leaving out an important kind of, we are looking at the media, we have looked at the platforms a lot, uh, you know, we're, but, but I think there's, there's one aspect that is a little bit maybe under-researched at the moment, and that's the whole area of the telecom operators, because they have, of course, they come from a highly regulated context, but they are also part of that big transition. And, you know, uh, we have this pending proposal on the e-privacy, <laughs> you know, that is a little bit uh, in a difficult stage, I would say. Uh, and then we have, um, you know, the review of the telecom key that we did in the last mandate, but that was more, I think, chirurgical and technical. So I hear a lot in my discussions that, uh, you know, here and there and from different angles, that this is maybe something that doesn't fit anymore in this kind of, you know, broader new system, new ecosystem that we are creating here in the data economy. So um, if I could make a, you know, <laughs> Mm -hmm. suggestion, then that's maybe something where also even an interdisciplinary approach might be something that could be quite useful. Because for me, um, I'm not at all authorized to say that this is my personal opinion, but maybe that's something that we will have to look at again, you know, once we have settled all the digital rulemaking where I would want research to be part of the execution, as I said earlier, but maybe mm -hmm. that's the kind of, you know, where it's really kind of the new thinking of do these rules really still fit? Um, uh, because we are no longer in the classical kind of, you know, situation of uh, the the um, the regulatory need that we had when we did the first telecom rule. So that's that's just an idea. Yeah, that's interesting that you mentioned that. And when I saw the first draft of the Digital Markets Act, I was reminded of the first telecommunication. Yeah. Uh, Regulation is that we have seen that a specific market uh, does not tend to, to competition for a long term, um, and we need to do something. And yeah. uh, there has to be some kind of asymmetric regulation. Uh, in the telecom sector, we are now, thanks to European regulation, um, uh, in a better um, a situation than we have been at the beginning of the, the telecom packages. And here we are starting a new field of law. Um, in, in fact, but some similarities, at least, to the yeah. beginnings but you, of telecom. Yeah, you saw the debate on the 5G standard and on, you know, so so I think there is, a, you know, it's complex, you know, so, so it's not so much only look at these telecom rules, but really also there's a broader context of, you know, technology competition and uh, the future of technology. And do we have the right setup, you know, for that? So that's, for me, an interesting new potentially a new theme that, you know, where bright research might be helpful. <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> this is very much something which we strive to, 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 to deliver. Um, perhaps we can uh, take a little sidestep to, to the audience. Um, we've collected a number of, of questions. Some of them take up again issues um, that we've uh, touched upon uh, previously. Um, so if you would just, you know, want to quickly refer to to these, um, then uh, um, we can we can cover them. So um, first of all, um, a, a commentator asks, would love to know from you how um, you see the uh, now again closer relationship uh, between uh, the U.S. and 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 Europe. Um, with a view to the future interoperability of legislative frameworks. So is the US becoming more European? <laughs> because obviously Europe isn't becoming more US uh, in terms yeah. of laws. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Well, I'm, I'm German. I think I have the transatlantic gene in my kind of <laughs> body. <laughs> um, um, and I was very, very heavily involved in the negotiation on the privacy shield that was, you know, annulled and where we have now a, a political agreement found on the follow up scheme. I strongly believe in transatlantic, uh, you know, cooperation, uh, not exclusively, but as an important kind of, you know, potential basis for um, inspiring also others. And I see 
And this has nothing to do now with the Ukraine war. Yes, we see now even a stronger security cooperation. But ever since we saw the change in the in the White House, uh, you know, I've really observed a different tonality, a different kind of, you know, um, possibility to kind of, you know, come together again and discuss. Um, and uh, you've seen that I mentioned the Trade and Technology Council. I think that's an interesting, uh, innovative idea uh, because I think we should not try to to have a new free trade agreement debate. That's really not, I think, what, what is the challenge here, but really kind of like-minded kind of partners addressing um, uh, in a conversation the challenges together. That's a very good idea. Um, I've studied in the States. I know how different the system is when it comes to lawmaking in the, in the US and how complex it is uh, also for President Biden to kind of get laws through the Congress. There was a moment, even under the Trump uh, administration, where we had hope that there might be soon um, a fundamental data protection law, uh, where there was for a moment a feeling that there was cross aisle kind of, you know, uh, support for it. Uh, I think that moment has gone. Um, uh, and I don't think that this is very likely under this administration to happen. And that's a very, very big difference. Um, that will also remain a challenge in the future privacy shields kind of finalization process. Um, that, you know, because I, I really want to stress, I think a lot of what we are doing now is also because we have the foundation of, um, you know, the GDPR, but then that's also different. We have the fundamental right of privacy. We have the European Court of Justice ruling of that fundamental right that will not go away. We cannot ignore that. That's a very different setup from the U.S where I see that the debate has really moved on. I remember a couple of years ago when I worked for the Commissioner for Justice, then Vera Jourova, and we had these regular meetings, EU-US, um, with uh, the, the Justice Minister, uh, the Attorney General, and, uh, you know, and, and, and we heard, for instance, we were working on the Code of Conduct on Illegal Hate Speech because that was after the migration crisis in 2015, after the terrorist attacks, there was really a huge wave of radicalization on the net, and we needed to do something at a European level. Not everybody could do a national law like the Germans, they have done the net Durchsetzungsgesetz, but we, there was no appetite to go for a law at the EU level. And that's where we came up with that self-regulatory code of conduct approach. And we talked about that with the Americans. And at that time, we still heard so much from, from the partners. Oh, but we have the First Amendment. And the First Amendment just doesn't allow any kind of, you know, discretion from, um, uh, from, the, from the fundamental right of the freedom of speech. And whilst we have, of course, also the right of free expression and the freedom of speech as fundamental rights, but we have a very different approach to kind of the individual rights and finding, a, you know, a consolidation between different rights. That's our constitutional order, and that's also what, what the courts do, not only at the national level, but also at the European level. That has changed. That conversation has changed. And I think, you know, a, a kind of a key eye opener was the 6th of January, was the kind of, you know, attack on the Capitol Hill. And, you know, that kind of, you know, visible um, expression of, you know, what harmful content can lead to um, and, you know, how, how much it can incite violence and, 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 and destroy things. Um, and that's why I think there is a potential. Um, and what uh, I can also share with you that there's a lot of, you know, discussion that we are having with the American friends on, you know, they might kind of also do things like as a pact with the platforms, you know, they will have to do it their way, as long as they're, they're driven by the same principles of increasing the accountability of the platforms, you know, giving the individuals more choice, avoiding that there is a limited kind of space for public speech and all these kind of things. But I do not believe that they will immediately could do the same hard regulation that we were able to do because, first of all, we are different setup. Um, you know, we are also, I think, more interested in regulating. Um, that is always different to do at a federal level in the United States. But what I definitely see is a meeting of minds um, and pushing through a similar agenda. Uh, which is about, you know, protecting our de de democratic order in the digital transition. And that's so helpful to see. I can maybe briefly supplement that with an observation from the academic field. And that is that the American colleagues are now extremely interested in concepts like the horizontal application of fundamental rights and uh, whether um, uh, platforms and in which way they are bound uh, by um, um, by freedom of speech of their users, for example, that's something which is very elaborated in, in European countries yeah. um, and not so much in, in the US. And so this kind of thinking um, 
um, influences and inspires the American colleagues at the moment. And so it's interesting to see that uh, a kind of, of uh, similar development on yeah. an um, exchange of academic ideas. Um, we, we are repeating the not, not not the mistakes, but rather the the the, the knowledge at different levels. But um, I mean, the, I think the story is still kind of a bit out on the question of how, how exactly online content, you know, influenced the events of May six or contributed to it or sort of ha helped uh, helped it happen. But this leads us uh, well to an, another question um, by uh, by a listener um, regarding oversight and enforcement. Um, so obviously, a big question will be how effective is the uh, is the is the enforcement structure of DSA and DMA going to be? Um, the uh, the the viewer asks, especially regarding the DSA, uh, what is uh, your take on the way that the um, oversight structure, the control structure, is currently designed? Um, what what future do you see in trilog negotiations regarding that structure? Will there be some surprises along the way, which of course would be you know difficult to see as uh, you know if you know them they're not surprises anymore. But still, what do you think? How is the structure going to change? And is that going to tell you some, uh, something about the internal dynamics, perhaps, of the Commission and the Parliament and the Council? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question because that was indeed a very very big surprise um, in the process because what we have proposed as the commission was very much building on what I elaborated earlier, the kind of the board structure with the data protection mm -hmm. authorities. And again, giving it a board structure to have a DSA coordinator um, that you know the member states were also free to kind of design who that could be, and then bringing them together into a board structure and with the commission having a soft touch kind of coordination role, but not too kind of you know pushy. Also because <laughs> that kind of came from the GDPR experience where we were much more ambitious in the beginning and wanted to have a leading role for the commission and where throughout the process, this was actually lowered and lowered and lowered and we ended up with the board. So we drew that experience and drew that lesson and tried to build that into the DSA. But in the DSA, it's totally different. And I think it has to do with, you know, I think two aspects. I think there's a little bit of um, still some counting the blessings on the implementation of the GDPR. We still have to get much better in implementing it in a forceful way and in a harmonious way. Um, and some of the really great concepts that we delivered, the delivered, the one-stop shop, the kind of, you know, that you have one kind of data protection authority to go to. Um, you know, all know that there is a huge pressure, therefore, on the Irish uh, data protection authority, because a lot of the players, of the big players, are located in Ireland. And, uh, and that's kind of... Um, has become of an issue of can we really trust or is the Irish uh, you know, data protection authority too soft you know, on them? So that's an experience and nobody wanted to repeat that with the Digital Services Act. And then also, I think we've moved on in terms of you know, uh, the need to enforce thoroughly against the big players. And then that's maybe best done at the central level. So there's a broader conversation in enforcement kind of in the EU, that kind of where you can see in different areas that you're moving a little bit from a totally decentralized enforcement structure to a more centralized one. So what we've seen in the course of the negotiations on the DSA is indeed that the idea has come up, no, 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 we want a commission to actually deal with that. Um, and we had not originally asked for it, as I said. And this is now, I think, the final stretch. I think that's going to happen, that on the Digital Services Act, especially for the very large online platforms, it will be the commission in charge of the day-to-day -day enforcement. That, of course, <laughs> requires a lot of resources because we really need uh, data analytics. We, they are, you know, we did not, not people like me, uh, you know, general lawyers who have <laughs> a general knowledge, but not that technical expertise. So we need to hire people. And uh, we are happy to do that, but you know how difficult it has become to get more money for the EU institutions. So actually something that is really interesting and being discussed at the moment in the trilogues is a supervision fee to be paid by the very large online platforms to actually finance <laughs> the supervision uh, imposed on them uh, by the commission. Uh, this is still very much in the making, so it might also still develop in a, in a slightly different way. But that's 
what I can share with you as the latest. And for me, it was an interesting surprise. But as I said, I see it also, I see it also in consumer protection enforcement, you know, the high, the whole kind of debate that we had in the COVID times about the vouchers of the travel kind of, you know, difficulties that consumers had. I see it now. Uh, there's a debate in data protection. Shouldn't we have a bit more of a, of a harmonized approach? And we now see it in the DSA. So there's a different, there's a, there's a bit of a trend to kind of, you know, come more closely together, which can be positive and negative. Positive, of course, if you are a proud commission official like myself, <laughs> uh, but also negative in the sense that I have started my career in the German system uh, as a German kind of, you know, um, um, uh, 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 civil servant. And I know how important it is not to lose that link with European uh, legislation, if you see what I mean. If, if you can always only kind of say, oh, this is Brussels doing, then you make it, uh, it has to remain a common project. So that's why it's smart that in the DSA, it's not everything that will fall on the commission. It's really the kind of the uh, competence for the very large platforms, because we need to keep that a common project um, for member states and the EU level alike. Do you see any any uh, possible backslash because um, um, the DSA is a kind of a hybrid because it has to do with markets, of course, but it has to do with public communication as well. And uh, the member states, when it comes to co uh, public communication, it's something where um, where to draw the line is not easy and has become really challenging. Um, you can say it's traditional media, that's what the member states do. Um, but if you take uh, the perspective, it's about uh, the democratically relevant communication and things like this information have to do with this as well. So it's really complicated and yeah. uh, we don't have an academic uh, good concept how to draw yeah. the line, to be frank. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is at the moment also a little bit of uh, an intellectual challenge in the design of the potentially future Media Freedom Act, because indeed, I mean, you have probably heard about the attempts from the from the, the media partners to ensure that there's a total exemption from the DSA for them. Uh, that would have been a door opener for disinformation, you know, talking about RT and Sputnik as we have done. Huh? So, uh, so, so, or, you know, luckily, I think we are moving more towards a procedural kind of, you know, safeguard solution there. But indeed, the same question will come up in the Media Freedom Act, you know. So, indeed, that's another kind of conceptual Mm -hmm. challenge mm -hmm. where again your input would be highly appreciated <laughs> <laughs> thanks we try to live up to that work i mean and after all you know um, there are obviously two two big policy options right if it's done either by the commission or by omission right <laughs> no but um in all seriousness um as we are sort of moving towards the, the last minutes of this uh, this wonderful uh, discussion, if you have um, two or three uh, big wishes apart from those which we already talked about, so you know to have more input from from science, that would be a perfect place to sort of weave them into into a, a final message to the uh, the community of, of researchers, policymakers, uh, students uh, who who are listening uh, to to your um, your take based on a, a decade and more of uh, of inside knowledge into how the commission works. Um, I think science research has a role to shake us up from time to time because we are a little bit kind of you know institutionalized in our ivory towers. We all are. Um, so so please keep on doing that. Um, you know fill us also with new themes, you know, because you might not always see the kind of the latest trends and you have more liberty to kind of look at things. Um, uh, you have also pressures, but <laughs> other pressures. Um, and uh, yeah, be creative in kind of, you know, joining forces, because I think uh, at the moment we really have a big, big chance of designing, you know, something quite meaningful together. And uh, it's better to do this together instead of against each other. So these are my wishes, maybe stronger together therefore that sounds good Wolfgang? yeah um, i think just one one thing uh, is that um, we have to think about formats how to better work together but uh, it very much depends on on people who are willing to listen and to talk and um, so um, uh, thanks very much for um, having this conversation because that uh, gave me at least a lot of ideas how to to improve and to better cooperate and um, 
uh, thank you for your time and your ideas and uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Renate Nikolai and Wolfgang Schulz for contributing to the second edition of Insights and Powers. Uh, Insights and Power, our, uh, our series of conversations between internet uh, scientists and internet policymakers. Thank you very much to Alex Stefan for hosting us uh, and to broadcasting us. Thank you very much to the organizers at the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society and the Leibniz Institute um, for Media Research, Hans Bredo Institute. Uh, signing off, um, my name uh, again is Matthias Kettemann. Very happy to have had you here. Um, thank you so much. Thanks to all our listeners. This will be online and, um, well, the internet doesn't always forget, so you'll be able to listen to what we've discussed for a long time. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thanks.